um, to the station to arrive on the Darnia Parkway. Um, it's been wonderful. Oh, Omar, the last weekend has been writing some great here so far. And uh, just to share a little bit about Omar, he was uh, born in Cairo and he was a in Egypt, uh, living in Cuba, and then at age of five, he moved to Cairo um, and was there until the age of 16. And I can't imagine leaving at age 16 to Montreal in the country for two years and finishing up high school. And then he uh, started at King's University and did his undergraduate degree in science. <laughs> and, and here we are. He, I think he took a course in creative writing, and uh, there, from there, his career has gone. And I can list some of his awards, which is amazing. Um, so he's worked for the Golden Mail as a journalist, and he's an author. Um, he earned a National Newspaper Award for investigative journalism and a Ralph Penny Award for young journalists. He appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, Arnica, GQ, and many other newspapers and magazines. His debut novel, American War, is an international bestseller and has been translated into 13 languages. Unbeknownst to me, I had actually read that book on a island trip. I had never read it, it was a gift to me, but he got me this book. <laughs> so it was really lucky because that was four years ago. It made his house look a lot better. Interested? Yeah. Um, he won the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Award. Oregon Book Award for Fiction, the Kobo Emerging Writer Prize, and has been nominated for more than 10 other prizes. It was listed as one of the best books of the year um, by the New York Times, Washington Post, U, um, MSR, Esquire, and was selected by the EDC as one of the top 100 novels that changed our world. His new novel, What Strange Paradise, was released in July of 2021 and won the Gala Prize. The Pacific Northwest Bookseller Award, the Oregon Book Award for Fiction, and was shortlisted for the Aspen Word Literary Prize. It's also named the best book of the year by the New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, and several other publications. So, say your work is recognized. Lovely. <laughs> Omar um, is currently living in Portland, Oregon, for your family, and uh, he's been able to travel here. He's currently the writer in residence, although Virtually, it has been so. This has been his opportunity to be in Ontario and near Kingston and writing again. And I think he'll be working or working closely with Smokey and John when they arrive tomorrow. Also, that. Yeah. Thanks, Ramu. There's just a lot of book awards. Like you put out any book, and there's just thousands of book awards that I I didn't know about. Um, hello, thank you so much for coming out to this. I appreciate it. Um, my name's Omar. Some of you may know me as the guy who just sits alone upstairs and doesn't talk to anybody. Uh, I promise I'm not being deliberately antisocial. I was just trying not to um, intrude on the real work that you folks are doing as opposed to me just making stuff up in the corner of the room. Um, I've only been to one of these. Uh, before I went to last week's, uh, my sense with these things is that generally how they go is that a subject matter expert or respected scholar of some sort comes up here, gives you a talk about their research and a very sort of informative and detailed breakdown of whatever facts they've managed to find. And um, for today's talk, I just need you to imagine the exact opposite of that, if at all possible, just a hopeless generalist with no expertise in any subject whatsoever rambling at you uh, with a bunch of unrelated stories uh, with no discernible conclusion at all. So uh, as long as we're all on the same page with that, we should be we should be fine. Um, so my name is Omar. I'm a writer. I was born in Egypt. I grew up in Qatar. This is a picture of Qatar. So um, this is Doha. The uh, So what happened was my my dad. Um, one day my dad, my dad was working at the Sheraton in Cairo, in downtown Cairo, just off of Tahrir Square. And the year before I was born, the president of Egypt was assassinated. The whole country was under martial law and uh, you weren't supposed to be out at night. And my dad, because he worked in the tourism industry and Egypt is very dependent on the tourism industry, had a little ID card that allowed him to be out at night. And so one day he's walking home from, from work uh, one night and there's these two soldiers and they're bored. They got nothing better to do. So they decide to give him a hard time. So they stop him and they say, show me your papers pulls out his little ID and the soldier without looking at it tears it up and says, show me your papers. Uh, and it became clear what was happening at that point, that this wasn't going to end well. 
And unfortunately, my dad's boss happened to be walking out and was friends with one of the soldiers. And that's how my dad kind of like escaped that night. But I think was the sort of breaking point where he was like, I need to get the hell out of this country. Um, and so he found a job in Libya of all places. So I'm four years old. We're at the airport in Cairo. We're getting ready to go to Libya. And the way Arabic names work is my middle name is my father's first name. His middle name is his father's first name, so on and so forth. So my father's name is Muhammad Ahmed Ra'ed. Muhammad Ahmed is an incredibly common combination of names. Uh, it just so happens somebody on the terrorism watch list had the same name. We get pulled into secondary. We miss the flight. The job offer is revoked. And a little while later, he gets another job offer in Qatar. Uh, Qatar, for those of you who don't know, is a little peninsula sticking out of Saudi Arabia. Um, which happens to have, I think, the third largest natural gas reserves in the world. Pound for pound, this is the richest place on Earth. And so I end up growing up in the richest place on Earth instead of Libya because of a coin flip at, at the airport. Uh, and I tend to start with that story because a lot of my writing, I write a lot about luck, um, about chance, because nothing I have ever done in my life has affected the trajectory of my life as much as a weird name, mistaken identity thing at the Cairo airport when I was four. Um, so this is sort of what downtown Doha looked like. Doha is the capital of Qatar. Uh, up top, that's what it looked like in the sort of late 90s when I was there. Uh, that's from about 15 years ago, and uh, that's from about 10 years ago. Uh, it has the most construction cranes per capita of anywhere in the world. Um, and I ended up I ended up growing up in this place. And the reason I sound this way is because I I went to American and British schools from from a fairly young age once I got there. Um, the thing about Qatar is that they want to protect the oil and gas wealth. Uh, everybody shows up in Qatar. 90 percent of the population is from somewhere else. Only 10 percent of Qatar is Qatari. Everybody else has come in from somewhere else to cash in on the oil and gas money. And because um, Qatar wants to protect that wealth, it's almost impossible to get citizenship. And so you can't own a home, you can't own a business. Everybody understands you show up, you make a little bit of money, you get out. And so my parents saw the writing on the wall. And towards the end of my 11 years there, I was there from 5 to 16. And towards the end of my time there, they started applying for citizenship in Canada, about which we knew almost nothing. Um, one of my dad's co-workers had applied for citizenship and said, you should probably do this because one day they're going to kick you out of here. Um, and so I ended up moving to uh, to Canada on the last day of August in 1998. Uh, the temperature when I left Qatar was 50 degrees. Uh, four months later, I'm standing in downtown Montreal. It's minus 40. Uh, I hated Canada. <laughs> For about two years, I despised Canada. Uh, nothing I had picked up in the first 16 years of my life was at all relevant to this new place. The first time I got on a bus uh, in Montreal, I tried to jam a 20 in the coin slot, assuming somebody would give me change. We, we had no public transit in Qatar. We had no sidewalks in Qatar. What you're looking at here is the Corniche, which is the only real walking spot in Qatar. It's too hot to walk. Everybody has a car. Everybody has a drive. Uh, taxes, we didn't have taxes. I didn't understand anything that was going on. Um, and I ended up doing that thing after two years of high school. I ended up doing that thing that some people do when they go to college, which is sort of invent a new personality for myself and pretend I'd always been that guy. Uh, and that, so that's what I did when I showed up in Queens. I basically just decided that everybody was new here and I would just lie about my entire life up until that point. Um, the only thing I've ever been any good at is writing. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you in this talk uh, is related to some of the assignments that sort of shaped how I think about writing and what I write about. Um, but I also come from a part of the world where you don't really become a writer. You don't, that's not something you do with your life. You don't become a painter, you don't become a musician. Uh, you become an engineer or a lawyer or a doctor. Um, whatever works for you. I don't know. Are you hitting them at random? That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so I thought, uh, I, th I didn't think that this, I, like I could tell stories for a living. That was that was the furthest thing from my mind. And so I thought, um, this is a horribly embarrassing story. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Hackers. It came out in the mid 90s, just a really awful, awful movie that made me think that computer science was a super exciting field to be in. Uh, so I thought I'll do computer science. That'll sort of fulfill the familial obligations, but also give me a chance to be creative. 
And so I showed up at Queens. Uh, I showed up on the first day of CISC 100. I don't know what they call computer science now, but it used to be computing information sciences CISC. And CISC 100 was for um, the kids who didn't know enough about computer science to take CISC 101. So it was like the pre 101 course. And the thing they made you do was write in a fake programming language, like, you know, Fisher Price, my first programming language, try to get a robot through a maze. So like if hit wall, turn left. And, if it, and I spent the entire hour and a half writing this program out, hit run, the robot goes in a circle, crashes into a wall immediately. And I knew that this was not for me, uh, that I had no aptitude for this at all. But instead of switching majors or trying to do anything about it, I just stopped going to class. Um, and I ended up, one day I was walking around campus and I saw a copy of the Queen's Journal. And they just, uh, their assistant news editor had just quit. So they had a little ad uh, advertising, uh, looking for a new assistant news editor. And I thought, okay, cool, this is, I think they'll let me write. And so I went and I, uh, I don't know if Shoeless Joe's still exists uh, or if they have wing night on Tuesdays, but it, it was, my interview was right after going to wing night on Tuesday. I was, I was in bad shape. I'd eaten like 40 suicide wings. It was, it was a horrible interview. I don't think anybody else applied, uh, which is why they gave me the gig. And that's where I got my education at Queens. I spent the next four years basically at the Queens Journal, uh, worked my way up to editor in chief. And, um, the thing that happens when you when you get up to editor in chief of the Queen's Journal is that there's summer internships at a daily newspaper. Usually it's the Wake Standard, but I had gotten this internship at the Edmonton Journal, and I got very lucky because with that portfolio of work that I had done in those internships, I landed a summer gig the year I graduated at, at the Globe and Mail, which was the summer of 2005. They had already hired all their summer interns, but at the last minute, the investment reporter at Report on Business decided to split parental leave with his wife who also worked at the Globe. And so suddenly they were out an investment reporter for the summer. So they hired me to be the fill-in investment reporter. And I showed up and I had, I think, $5 and change in my checking account. The data I showed up at the Globe and Mail to be their investment reporter. If you took any investment advice from the Globe and Mail in the summer of 2005, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, but it got me into the paper and at the end of, of the summer, they gave me a 10 month contract and at the end of the 10 month contract, they gave me a full time job and I showed up as a general assignment reporter on the Toronto desk uh, in June of 2006, I think it was. And I showed up on a Monday and on that Friday, we had the biggest terrorism arrests in Canadian history, the Toronto 18 case. I don't know if any of you remember this, but it was these 18 kids. Some of them were kids. Some of them were like 17, 18 years old who had all these grand plans of blowing up Parliament Hill and beheading the prime minister. And they didn't do any of that. They were being watched the whole time. And on that Friday, the RCMP swooped in and um, arrested all of these guys. And it was the biggest news story in the world for about a week. It was the biggest news story in Canada for about a year. Um, and the Globe got beaten really badly on it. Uh, so if you ever go back and look up the front pages of the Star and the Post the following day, uh, front page, full front page coverage of all of this. The Globe had a brief on A3. We had, I think it was a paragraph and a half or something like that. There was a, an editor who eventually had to resign as a result of how badly we screwed that up. We screwed it up so badly, there's a story in the New York Times, you can look this up, about how badly the Globe and Mail got beaten on this. They never do this, like this is not a thing you do. Anyway, so the following Monday, uh, Edward Greenspan, the editor in chief of, of the Globe and Mail, has an all hands on deck meeting. He brings in all 300 editorial reporters at the Globe building, which was at Front and Spadina in Toronto back then. And he's looking around for anybody who has any experience with the Middle East, uh, with Islam. He's looking for brown people, right? And in a newsroom of 300, he finds two of us. He finds me and he finds Kamal, the theater critic. And so he calls us over and he says, you're gonna go to the mosques where these kids went. You're gonna do some street reporting. You're gonna find, like, all right, this is this is what I do. This I'm a general assignment report. So I go to one of the mosques. Kamal, the theater critic, goes to the other mosque. We come back. I'm writing my file. Kamal sends me his file, and it's 500 of the most beautiful words I've ever read on the acoustics in the in the mosque and the texture of the velvet drapes that were, because he's a theater critic who just happens to be brown. And that was the start of two years of my of my life on that story. Two years of trying to figure out how these kids who had a fairly benign upbringing. Um, in Mississauga end up going from that to like building detonators off of YouTube videos and stuff. And it was, uh, um, it was a weird assignment. And 
it was also. It was a very lonely assignment because of that whole like there's two brown people in the room sort of thing. I remember for the longest time we were calling everything in the club. If any woman had her hair covered in any way, she was wearing a niqab. Nobody in the room knew what a niqab was or how it differed from a hijab or a burqa or whatever. Everything was a niqab. And I knew that this was bullshit, to be honest with you. But I was also 24 and I was terrified and there was no way I was going to send an, ed an email to the managing editor. Um, and finally, our, our Middle Eastern correspondent, um, the guy who'd been based in, I think it was Jerusalem for the longest time, Mark McKinnon, ended up sending an email saying, what the hell are you doing? We've been getting this wrong for months. Um, it was a lonely beat. Um, all I ever wanted to do since I got to the Globe was, was um, work on stories that if I had not told them, they would have not been told. And when you start generally in journalism, you do the exact opposite of that. When you start, you're at the bottom of the hierarchy. There is a house fire. You and the 30 other interns in Toronto are going to the house fire and you're going to write the exact same story. And I was slowly sort of working my way up through that. But the whole time I was bugging the foreign foreign affairs editor to put me on the Afghanistan rotation. Um, because at the time there was still a Canadian military presence, a fairly significant Canadian military presence in Afghanistan. And so Canadian media cared about Afghanistan. As soon as that ended, that sort of everybody kind of that all faded. But at the time, we had a guy named Graham Smith, who was our sort of semi full time Afghanistan correspondent. And what he would do was sort of eight weeks on, eight weeks off. He'd do eight weeks in country, and then he'd go to Dubai and do God knows what for eight weeks. Nobody ever asked. Um, r and uh, whatever. Uh, but there was a list of that you could get on to fill in those eight weeks when he wasn't there. And I kept asking and I kept asking and finally, in 2000, late 2007, towards the end of 2007, they said, fine, we're going to put you on the list. And that was my first. That was my first real assignment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is a lav light armored vehicle. It's one of the more common things you would see around the highways of Kandahar. Well, a lot of highways in a lot of provinces. Uh, sign down here. I forget whether this is Pashu or Dari, but it basically says stay away. Uh, the turret up there is what happens if you don't stay away, if you don't give this thing enough enough space. Um, when I showed up in Afghanistan, I was, I think, I want to say 25. Um, I'd read way too much Hemingway. I had a very bizarre notion of what a foreign correspondent, what a war correspondent does, the sort of swashbuckling figure who shows up in country and does all this heroic thing. All of it was nonsense. Um, the first indication that I got that it was all nonsense was before I showed up in Afghanistan. Um, I, I'm not the only one hearing that, right? That's not that's a thing. OK, I'm just going to assume it go away on its own. Um, for insurance purposes, before you can go into a war zone, uh, the vast majority of media corporations will not let you go because their insurance companies will not let you go until you do what is called hazardous environment training. And what that is, is you go in our case, we went to a farm in rural Virginia where a bunch of former SAS guys, the British Special Forces, uh, basically simulate explosions all around you and like teach you how to tie a tourniquet with a tree branch and you know, that sort of thing. Um, and it was, I think it was like two of us from the Globe, a couple of people from the New York Times, and then like three or four people from what were very obviously like CIA fronts. It was like, I'm here from the you know, American Prospect Peace Institute. And you're like, yeah, OK, sure. Um, but they give you the, it, it boiled down to, you know. If you if you hear a whistling noise, drop to the ground, uh, cover your ears, point your feet in the direction you think the RPG is going to land and breathe out because the first thing to kill when when a missile or a rocket or an RPG or whatever hits is not uh, shrapnel. It's not fire. It's the overpressure wave. It's just air being forced out. And if it hits your lungs and your lungs are full, it's more likely to kill you. Um, so this was the. The brilliant piece of information that we were armed with when we showed up uh, back here. This is the Canadian media tent. This was the Canadian portion of the Kandahar airfield. When I showed up, Kandahar airfield was like a small city. I think it was about 25,000 people at any given moment in, in uh, Kandahar airfield. Uh, just this series of those kinds of tents, these concrete barrier things, prefab buildings, 
tons of shipping containers that had been repurposed. Uh, there was a Tim Hortons. It was the worst Tim Hortons I've ever been to. They had to ship everything, you know, across the world. Um, a Burger King. Um, one day we were in that media tent and we hear all of this commotion coming from the boardwalk, which was the central space, the central gathering area in Kandahar Airfield. And so we rush out to see what's up. And it's tons and tons of soldiers sort of hooting and hollering. And out come the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders onto the stage to perform for like a half hour. It looked like, I don't know how many of you have seen Apocalypse Now, but there was a scene from Apocalypse Now that it was that. It was exactly that. It was the most surreal thing. Um, and it was part of that sort of that obliteration of everything that I thought a war zone was. Uh, this is inside the media tent. Um, you'll see a couple of things. You'll see over here the sort of flak vest, the helmet. Uh, blue was supposed to be press. Um, a lot of us had better equipment than a lot of the soldiers. Um, one of the most popular items at the exchange with the sort of like general store on the base was air canisters because dust gets into everything and sand gets into everything. So your laptop keyboard stops working after a while. So uh, tons and tons of those. Um, and then this is, um, this is what a sniper rifle looks like. It was another one of those things where we walk outside the tent one day and the, um, generally if you're, if you're in, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but if you're in this kind of situation, you're either inside the wire or you're outside the wire. If you're a sort of public affairs officer for the military, you're usually inside the wire. You're in the safety of the of the base. Uh, if you're a sniper, you're outside the wire. You're spending weeks up on a hillside somewhere and you're um, using a paper bag for waste disposal and that sort of thing. And these were the snipers had just come back from outside the wire and they were showing off their, their guns and whatnot. Um, so this is the sort of stuff I thought I would remember um, from, from that assignment. Uh, but it, it didn't end up being the stuff I remembered from that assignment, or at least not the stuff that sort of seared into my head. Um, this is the FOB at Masamgar. FOB is uh, short for Forward Operating Base. So unlike the Kandahar Airfield, which is the sprawling sort of small city, um, these are tiny little outposts in the middle of nowhere. And we went out to one of these, uh, and as a result of their size, they come under attack much, much more often than, than the actual base. Um, and so the day we had shown up for the 30 days prior, every single night, these folks had come under RPG attack. And we were informed that their turrets, which are up on the sort of hillside, had this mechanism by which they could calculate the trajectory of these rockets in real time, calculate where the rocket must have come from, swing the turret over to that location and fire, and that all of this happened in like a second or two. And what that meant is that every single person who had shown up for those 30 days straight had been obliterated. And yet every following night, somebody else had shown up to do the same thing. And these rockets that they're firing are not sort of state-in-the-art NATO weaponry. This is the stuff the Soviets left behind 30 years ago. So, or at the time, I guess 30 years ago. Um, so they had no idea where these rockets were even going. They were sort of launching them in the general direction, hoping to hit somebody. In the 30 days that they had done this, they'd managed to kill one person. They killed an Afghan interpreter who was in the shower stalls and the shrapnel came in through the wall. Um, and it was a real education on the cyclical absurdity of this, of this violence. Um, and sure enough, the night that we were there, the one night we were there, we're walking back from the mess tent and you hear the whistling sound. And so I do the thing, I drop to the ground, I cover my ears, point my feet in some direction, I don't know where the hell this thing's gonna go, breathe out, and then it ended up landing over there instead of over here. And um, nothing I would have done or not done would have made a difference if it had landed over here. Like where my feet were pointed would not have had the slightest sort of difference. Um, again, I write a lot about luck. Um, and, and these situations sort of tend to reinforce that. Um, so what happened at the end of this assignment? I was in Afghanistan late 2007, late 2009. Um, it sort of rearranged my thinking about violence in general. And um, it was one of two places that did that. So Afghanistan completely rearranged my thinking about the physical violence of war uh, because I got to see it up close, but also because I got to see the hierarchy of it. So for example, at the Kandahar airfield, the outside cordon is where all the attacks happen because it's right on the highway. So if you're going to detonate a car bomb, you're going to detonate it on the outside cordon. The inner cordon is uh, much more well protected. Lo and behold, 
it's Afghan troops who always protect the out, uh, the outer cordon, and it's always NATO troops on the inner cordon. There's a hierarchy of whose life is worth more. Um, and so Afghanistan was one of those places that sort of rearranged my thinking about the physical violence of war. The other assignment that has influenced everything I've written ever since, my fiction, my short stories, my novels, came in the year between 2007, 2009. So those were my two stints in Afghanistan. 2008, the year in between, I spent mostly in Guantanamo Bay. Um, again, this was one of those cases where Canadian media was temporarily interested in this place because the final Western uh, prisoner at Guantanamo Bay, uh, the detention camps, was Omar Khadr, who was Canadian. And so we would go down there for his pretrial hearings. Um, for those of you who don't know, Gitmo, for, the, for about 100 years, was just this sleepy marine base that nobody cared about. They intercepted a migrant ship every now and then, and then the war on terror happened, uh, and suddenly they needed a place to put these folks that were um, being tried under a made up system. It was an ad hoc military system that was sort of, they made it up on the spot. And they picked Guantanamo Bay because it's not really Cuba, but it's also not really the United States. Uh, it's a nowhere place. What you're looking at here is the remains of Camp X-Ray. So when they first started shipping over the first prisoners, um, there was no facility in Guantanamo Bay that could hold them. And so they had to make something up overnight. And they built, if you ever see the sort of defining photo of the Guantanamo Bay detention camps, it's a guy in a green, in an orange jumpsuit who's in this thing that looks like a slightly oversized dog kennel kind of thing. That's Camp X-Ray. Camp X-Ray has not been, here's another photo of it. Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of these things, right? Um, Camp X-Ray was not around for that long. Um, they eventually um, moved everybody out of there into more permanent facilities, camps one, two, and three. A bunch of people killed themselves in one, two, and three, so they made four, five, and six. Uh, four is a medium security. Five and six are supermax. They're based on supermax facilities in the US. They took the same blueprints and built a mini version of it. It was Halliburton that actually built them. There's a little plaque you see on the outside of this thing. Um, but because of those photos, Camp X-Ray, this temporary facility, has become sort of the defining image of what Guantanamo Bay is. The reason that when ISIS and these groups have hostages and they film those videos, the reason they make them wear the orange jumpsuits is a direct reference to this place. And the US military would love nothing more than to tear all of this down, but it might be used as evidence in future lawsuits, which is why it now looks like this. They won't tear it down, but they're also not going to maintain it, so it just sort of looks like something out of a horror movie. Um, this is the inside of one of the interrogation sheds. Um, I talked about this notion that, that Afghanistan sort of influenced my thinking about the physical violence of war. Guantanamo Bay, which is easily the most Kafkaesque place I've ever been, influenced my understanding of every other kind of violence that holds up physical violence. I don't think you can have physical violence in a vacuum. You need other forms of violence to hold it up. Linguistic violence, euphemistic violence, bureaucratic violence, and all of those were on display at this place. This was the most surreal place I'd ever been. Um, to give you a sense, um, at one point we're walking around, we're touring Camp 4, and I asked one of the soldiers, I said, so when do the prisoners and immediately the soldier stops me and says, we don't have prisoners here, sir. We have detainees. And it was vital to this man that there be no prisoners because a prisoner implies a prison sentence, which you have to define. A judge at some point has to say, I sentence you to. Even if it's a life sentence, somebody has to define it. A detainee you can just hold forever. Um, so there were no prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. There were no interrogations in Guantanamo Bay. This is an interrogation shed. <laughs> Clearly there were interrogations. They never called them that. They called them reservations. As in detainee 8246 has an 8.30 p.m. reservation. That means that they were gonna be dragged into this place. Um, and all of this stuff was holding up all of the other forms of violence that were happening in this place. When I talk about sort of bureaucratic violence, some of it was, was really absurd. Um, the, the media room in, in Guantanamo, where we all filed our stories, was in the corner of this unused hangar, this giant sort of hangar. And at sort of 9 p.m. every night, they would lock the door to it. And, you know, we've got reporters from all over the world. People are filing at two in the morning. People are filing at all hours. But if you wanted to get into the media room, 
uh, after 9 p.m. You had to walk to the other side of the euphemistically named Camp Justice, which was this temp tent city. You had to find the on-duty soldier that night, wake them up, bring them over to unlock the door for you. And at a certain point, people were complaining. All the reporters were saying, listen, nobody's stealing anything here. Like it's not, it's a hangar in Guantanamo Bay where nobody, can you, can you do something about this? And finally they, they decided that they were going to put one of those like keypad, you know, one, two, three, four, and you enter the little, so all this had to go all the way up to the base commander. The base commander had to approve. It came all the way back. This took months. And finally they install this thing. But the journalists are like, thank you. Thank you so much. What's the code? And they're like, no, no, after 9 p.m. you have to go get the soldier and the soldier will enter the code for you. It was that kind of place. It was um, thoroughly bizarre. We used to get these documents um, that were the court transcripts, all the motions that had been filed that day in court, we would get copies of and almost universally they would be blacked out. You would get some paragraphs where the only word that wasn't blacked out is the or a, you know, and then they black, 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 black. And one time we get one of these things and it comes along with an appendix, appendix A. An appendix A, same thing, blacked out, blacked out, blacked out. Except that appendix A was just a copy of a New York Times article that the lawyer for the defense had attached to the motion so the judge wouldn't have to go look it up because he'd referenced it in the, in the, in the motion. So immediately we all run to our computers, bring up the New York Times website, load up that article, and you can immediately see what it is the military has decided is too dangerous for you to see. And at no point during this process did anybody involved say, why are we trying to censor a copy of a news story that just appeared in the most popular newspaper on earth? Um, is a surreal place. And between them, um, Guantanamo Bay and Afghanistan formed the basis of my thinking around a thing I was writing at the time. Um, all I've ever wanted to do is write fiction. Uh, journalism paid the bills and gave me the education that I didn't get at Queens because I never went to class, but but journalism did a lot for me, but fiction was always my first home. And um, I, while I was working at the Globe, I was writing fiction in my spare time and I wrote three novels, three thoroughly unpublishable novels uh, during my time there. And um, after Afghanistan and Guantanamo Bay, I started working on this thing called American War, which was basically an attempt to, to gather my thoughts about the absurdity of this era that I had sort of jumped into. Uh, I came to Queens the year before 9-11 and I jumped into journalism right around the time of the war on terror, you know, the invasion of Iraq and, and that. Mo and I was trying to think about the absurdity of this and, and how to write about it. And I ended up taking the hallmarks of this moment and trying to recast them in the center of the United States. And that's what American war ended up being. It ended up being a very sort of simplistic trick on my part to take the things that were happening all the way over there that were very easy to ignore if you lived in this part of the world and recast them in the heart of the empire. And so American War is this novel about a second civil war and the aftermath of it and how somebody becomes radicalized in that environment. Um, for the longest time, I knew where the story was gonna be. What I didn't know was where it was gonna start. And one of my final assignments at the Globe before I up and quit uh, was in southernmost Louisiana. Uh, if you've never been, um, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth, just culturally, geographically um, stunning. It's also disappearing at the rate of about a football field of land every half hour, something like that. It's one of the worst climate change. Yeah, every time I say that, somebody looks at me like that, like, you know, you got that wrong, but that's that's the rough rate. Um, it's, it's lost the equivalent of a good chunk of the Maritimes, I think, in the last 60 years or something like that. Um, this photo was taken from the side of a road that floods regularly. Uh, and when you're down there, your GPS starts freaking out because it doesn't know when you're on land and you're on water. Like it doesn't, it can't tell the difference anymore. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. Uh, climate change, saltwater intrusion. The saltwater comes in, kills the root systems of the plants. Um, this is the part where I'm usually much more confident saying all of this stuff, but I realize that I have a bunch of biology students and you're all, anyway, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I was told down there. Um, the, the root systems hold a lot of the land together. You start killing those off. You end up getting like shrimping where there used to be farming or something like that. And um, there's also miles and miles of oil and gas pipelines that have been laid across this part of the country over the last hundred years. Some of them are so old that they don't know where they are. Nobody has accurate mapping of these things, so they're just sort of quietly leaking away somewhere, I assume. Um, normally, the river itself would uh, would counteract some of this. The Mississippi, if left to its own devices, is a bit of a sidewinder, you know, move 
sort of east and west over the decades and centuries. But in order to keep cities like New Orleans from um, from drowning, uh, the I think it was the Army Corps of Engineers uh, basically levied this river in place. So now it doesn't do that anymore. Uh, so it doesn't redeposit sediment and so on and so forth. Um, I'd been bugging the foreign editor to let me do this story for a very long time. This is when you're driving around uh, the southern part of the state, you come across these signs from the last oil spill, and they're basically just like, if you want to cash in on it. Uh, this is what a high school uh, looks like. Uh, almost all these buildings are, are, are built on some form of stilts because everybody knows what's coming. And the state itself knows what's coming because they've built these sort of attempts to, to, to like these levees and these sort of seawalls and whatnot. But they build them a certain certain way up the state and the unspoken message to everybody south of that is in the long run we can't save you this is what we think we can save and you can almost see lines on the map like it's it's pretty clear cut what they think they can they can hold on to um and so i was writing this book that that um was very much concerned about things the united states had done to the world and i knew instantly that i had to start this book in a place where the world was doing something to the united states um and that ended up sort of cementing um, that first novel of mine, American War. I wrote this thing. I didn't think I was going to. I didn't have an editor or an agent or a book deal or any expectation this thing would see the light of day. Uh, and it was just sitting on my hard drive with the other three novels. And then one day I had a bad day at work. I had a day where I felt like I was just rewriting press releases. Um, you know, when journalism is good, it's really good. You feel like you're making a positive change in the world. And, you know, uh, and when it's bad, you just feel like, there's a famous phrase about what journalism is, what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And on a bad day, you're just comforting the comfortable. Um, and I, I remember I put down the phone that day with my managing editor and I thought to hell with this. And I emailed a literary agent who I'd met eight years earlier randomly. And I said, listen, I know it's every journalist's worst nightmare uh, when a, uh, every literary agent's worst nightmare when a journalist says, I have a novel for you, but I have a novel for you. And she was kind enough to read it. Three months later, we sold it to Knopf in, in uh, New York. And I figured um, if I wasn't going to jump off the cliff and hope there's water at the bottom under these circumstances, like if I wasn't going to commit to the thing I wanted to do with my life when I had a book deal, uh, then I was never going to do it. So I quit at the Globe, and it's been an incredibly up and down existence uh, ever since. The one thing I would say for the Globe, every other Friday you got a paycheck, and it was usually for the same amount. Um, that's not how writing works when you publish novels. There have been years where I've made close to 400,000 in royalties, and there's been years where I've made 4,000 in royalties. And that's not a way to live. That's a very sort of up and down. But I don't answer to anybody, um, and I get to do the thing I love. Um, the second novel I wrote was this book called What Strange Paradise, which um, was a book that was looked very much like it was going to wreck my career. American War came out and did pretty well, well enough that I should have been writing more speculative fiction, dystopias, and things in that mode. And instead, I wrote this very short, very contemporary repurposed fable that was nothing like the first book. And almost all my foreign uh, editors passed on it. Uh, you heard in the intro, American War has been translated into 13 language. Um, what Strange Paradise has been translated into one. The Arabic edition is coming out next year. Um, almost all the foreign editors bailed on it, and um, my my editors at Knopf didn't didn't like it so much. They weren't enthusiastic. And then I got very lucky with two things. I got a very good review in the New York Times, and then the thing with the Giller happened and sort of saved the career from being railroaded. Which again is part of this notion of like what a writing life is like. Um, I've written bad articles for the Globe. I was still employed the next day. Um, like you have to do you have to do something pretty bad. Uh, to, to mess that up. But with the books, if the second one hadn't done well, that would have been the end of my career. Um, these days I write a lot of cli-fi. Sorry, I've been rambling at you for 45 minutes, so this will be the last slide, I promise. Um, these days I write a lot about cli-fi, which is what the, the fancy name for climate fiction. Nobody actually knows what the hell climate fiction is. It's a weird term and it's brand new. And it's sort of like calling a book like people fiction. Like it has people in it. We, you know, the story takes place in a climate. Uh, this is 20 minutes from my house in uh, in Oregon. This is, I think, Detroit Lake. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, two days after we came home from the hospital with our second child, we, we had a we had a three day old, 
and the forest fires. They were the biggest forest fires in, I think, uh, the history of the West. I think that record's been broken since then, but um, we were on evacuation notice. We were sitting in our house with um, our bags packed and all the little air filter things that we had in the living room, and we were waiting to see if that fire would jump the river. This is, we're all in Clackamas County, and we were in the north end of Clackamas County, and this is 20 minutes south of where we are. And uh, our backyard is sort of the distance from our rear window to the edge of the backyard is basically from this table to that wall. And we couldn't see that wall because of the, the smoke. For the longest time, uh, Portland had the worst air quality index in the world um, because of these fires. Um, and it's sort of, it brought home this notion that whatever the hell climate fiction is, whatever kind of writing it is I do these days, um, it's trying to address a space that I have no familiarity with from the first 39 years of my life. Um, the world as I thought it would be when I was younger is careening into something that I know nothing about and can't fully wrap my head around. And the reason I end with this is because you're all doing actual work uh, and you have to contend with whatever this is. I can make stuff up, um, but you have to figure out how the hell you communicate the work that you do in a world that is spinning out this way. Um, that's an incredibly depressing way to end a talk, and I apologize. Um, that said, I'm more than happy to take any questions you have about writing, uh, queens, uh, craft, uh, book deals, movie deals, publishing in general, anything at all. Um, but before that, thank you so much for your patience, everyone. Appreciate it.